All right. So, everybody, welcome to class three in Foundations of Fabrication. We've got lots of exciting things to talk about. I'm really looking forward to the show and tell a little bit later. But today, we make a hard turn out of the world of code and into the world of woodworking, which is an entire, I would say, third of Make Haven in terms of space-wise. It will be a great thing for us to talk about, look at, and sort of jump into as an entire skill set for us to really develop and play with. A really nice part about this, and especially that it comes right after, that's a window in there. Oh, gotcha, okay. A, um, a big part of this, of, of like what this is, is that it's a nice about face from doing all the code and very technical things to now we get to sort of move into the sweet analog nature of woodworking, which is really a nice transition. So as we do that, um, we're going to take a look at sort of what are the, the tools, what are some of the best practices of wood, what are some of the terms that you need to know, so that if you're Googling or you're looking for examples, you've got all those skills. And a big one is to really identify what's the core purpose of each one of the machines. So several of you might know many of these things, but at any time if you've got any questions, feel free to stop me. And if something pops up in the chat that I don't notice, which is completely possible because I'm going to be just talking, let me know. We'll address the question as it comes up because uh, this is sort of a team effort to make sure that everything gets addressed. So with that and no further hesitation, let's hop over to, let's see, is this, this even, I don't know if this one's even working. I was just going to see if we pop it in over here. There we go. All right. So throw this back up here. And this we can close back down. And so I wanted to hop over to the website. So in, in the unit two, we've got our intro to woodworking. This is going to cover sort of the core of the skills that we have. This is really, I would say, the first of a couple of our, like, broad introductions to sections of Make Haven, uh, where really the two sort of get coupled together. There's lots and lots of badges in the woodshop area, and so essentially week one is all about badging, and week two is all about applying those skills to make a project. Because just getting the time to badge is sometimes something you have to save a little space for. So we're going to go through and first off identify a little bit about what the sort of badging groups are, how you'd, how you'd filter through those, and what are sort of the recommendations. We'll go through just sort of what's here to talk about some of these terms. And then on, on here, we've got some notes that are actually posted on the page. So if you wanted to see them there, they're going to be a way for us to go through sort of what are the machines, what's their main purpose, especially the large stationary ones. And then we've got long lists of like what are all of the possible hand tools that we will get to. So we're going to go through all those sort of high-level skills, and then if we can make the tech work, it would be awesome to, to go mobile, but I think that we'll have more than enough to talk about here. And then a great thing to do would be to come in for office hours and sort of play around with the, seeing what the tools are, make sure that you're good there, and planning out some time to get badged this week. So in any case, we're going to head back over to the website and take a look. When you're talking about badges, I would say the minimum badges that you, these, these have been grouped into sort of like, uh, like wine pairings, but for badges, right? So the minimum uh, that I'd say here is you want to get the sliding compound miter saw and the drill press. If you're looking through our suggested projects for the week, which we'll get to later, the, those two will let you do sort of the, the simplest of the minimum projects. So just the compound miter saw will let you cut compound angles, which is a really useful tool. And then the drill press lets you cut straight holes. So if nothing else, you can have those two skills. And from there, you can actually make a fair amount of stuff. Uh, but then there's other pairings, like squaring wood is a whole process. We're going to go through that later, where you can take a raw piece of wood, because when it comes out of a tree, it's almost entirely, almost always round. And so getting it from that round to a square shape so that you can build things with blocks, because we tend to think in blocky shapes, Though that's, that's a whole suite of tools that luckily we have some really nice versions of here. There's, uh, for, 
for from prepared wood. So if you don't need to worry about squaring, if you go to Home Depot or Lowe's, you can often buy a square piece of wood, sort of like prime pine is what they call it at Home Depot is the one that I'm most familiar with. Uh, and so you buy prime pine and it's already in theory square and straight and ready to go. There's a, a set of tools that you'd need to learn for once you've got wood that's ready for use. Then there's some fine woodworking tools. Uh, a wood lathe is a really interesting one. Most of woodworking is done with square shapes, but the lathe actually turns wood so that you can get rounded shapes. And there's lots of interesting, complicated ways to make that happen. And then if you just go to the Make Haven page and search on the equipment filtered by woodworking, you'll get all of them, which is a lot of fun. I think that I might actually be almost close to a complete woodworking set of badges myself, which is a lot of fun to sort of work through there. Um, so as we're talking about woodworking, what I've done here, this, is, this subject is one of the ones where I find the videos probably the most illustrative. I'm a big fan of watching woodworking videos, and Tamar is one of my favorites. She's up there at the top. Uh, she does the 3x3 three three custom. So I've got, essentially, this is just my YouTube feed at this point that has now made it onto the Foundations page. Um, and so there, when you watch people do woodworking, it's been a classic on like PBS and all those platforms for decades to have woodworking shows where woodworkers see what each other are doing. They communicate in that way. It's a very visual sort of medium. And so having that experience of looking at what someone else has done and learning directly from it is really valuable. So I've got lots of videos on here to try and explain. I would recommend watching you know, as many of those as you'd like to see. There are lots of skills that you can go after, but there's some common language that's really helpful to sort of understand where that's coming from so that you can process what they're doing, so that we can have a common vocabulary going forward. And that's just names for the sides of a board, which may seem rudimentary, but you've got the board face, which is the larger, flatter edge. In a two by four, that would be the side that's the four, the broader side. The two part is the edge of the board. So that's the skinnier side that runs along the length. And then the end grain is where you've got your grain that runs out. Uh, and if you imagine grain is just a fiber along the piece of wood, that's where the fibers would end, which is why it's called end grain. So it's, and it's literally like little tubes running down along the wood. So that's in some, in some types of wood, it's very, very noticeable how that grain runs. It can even still do a great job of wicking in moisture. And so wood grain, or gluing end grain is not necessarily the strongest, but we can get to those things in a minute. Uh, but as we're doing that, I referenced two by fours before, which I'm sure you're all well aware of. But you may, it, it, sometimes people learn it, sometimes they don't, but there's a difference between a nominal size and an actual size. A two by four, if you go buy one at Home Depot, is not actually two inches by four inches. That's what it was rough cut before it got trimmed down to the size that it is when it's in the store. The really, the four is really three and a half, and the two is really one and a half. So they take off a half an inch just to get it down to the size that it needs to be. So there's a little bit of trickiness in how things get sized in wood. There's also, if you're buying wood from a, from a retailer or from a, a dealer, you're going to buy with strange terminology like eight-quarter lumber means that it's two inches thick, or you can buy, you know, different thicknesses referenced in amounts of quarters. And so we'll go through where are some places where you can buy lumber in the area, uh, which I'm still relatively new, so I would be happy for us to share with each other if you know of any other locations. But we'll get to that in a minute. But there's board face, edge, and end grain. So when you're, one of the processes that we need to go through is how to square wood. We're going to go through that with the slide just to sort of see how that goes. But essentially what you need to do with that is you're going to use a collection of tools to take lumber that may be approximately square and really get it so that the sides are planar, so that they are a flat surface. And if you've got three points, you know, in math terms, three points define the plane. Two points can define a line. Three points to define a plane. And so we want to have nice planar faces that are parallel to each other and then perpendicular to the edges. So all of those are really important skills that we can try, really important things that we can make happen with a different suite of tools. How are you doing, Cedric? Good. And so we have processes in that, like resawing, using a joiner, 
uh, using a wood lathe where we can get those different sorts of things to happen. And so we'll take a look at what those are in just a minute. But a wood lathe is an interesting tool because it turns in instead of being square. We'll see that. And let's see. Yeah, I want to just hop into the end of the slides. That's where we're going. So as we talk about all these things, there's essentially videos for each one of these different tools, the bandsaw, the lathe, some tips right here. Uh, we have a table saw saw stop at Makehaven, which is a fantastic thing. It means that it will immediately, it will wreck the blade and a brake system instead of your finger if you accidentally touch the blade. So there's some really great safety mechanisms that are put in place to better uh, keep everybody safe while here working on the table saw. But as we go through those, we're going to take a look at what all of these tools do, sort of how to define them, and some basics about all these pieces. This is generally going to be high-level woodworking, uh, where we talk about the broad ideas, and then we sort of go from there. So if you've got any woodshop tips, feel free to chime in. So this is our week three stuff. We're doing the introduction. And so first off, if we're talking about woodshop, we should make sure we identify what you need to get a badge here before we really hop into that. Because I've had a couple people ask, and I just want to make sure that we're all very clear about what this process is, what it looks like, and how you get there. First off, in order to get badges, you need to do a few, there's a few steps to move through. The first off, is you're going to find the badge on the Make Haven site. And so here I've got two links for how you could do that. If you go over here to All Badges, which is generally how I've done it, but Kate has kindly told me that that's the weird way to do it. Uh, if you go by Equipment List and then you say you're, you're walking into Make Haven, you're brand new, you've never been here before, uh, but you've checked in and are a member, and you want to learn how to use the bandsaw, you come find the bandsaw and click on this. And when you do that, you're brought to a page like this where probably Lior has made, has Lior made all of these pretty much? Yeah, Lior has made all of these badging videos. So Lior is going to talk you through how to do this. There's a video that you can watch here, and we'll, we'll mute it, but let Lior talk in the background. So Lior will talk you through sort of the basics of how to use the machine. These badges have a certain specific role here. They're to keep you safe and to keep the machine safe. It, in that order, you are more important than the machine. But it is important that you keep what's going on. And Kate, yeah, I missed your question. But yeah, it's always a half an inch for the the 4x4 four four fence post is a 3.5 by 3.5 inch fence post. I just saw your question. So yeah, it is always a half an inch that is pulled off when you go from the the name size from the nominal size to the standard size for a lot of those common construction pieces. But as we're watching, if you're trying to get a badge on the bandsaw, here Lior is walking you through sort of what these processes are. And this, some of these videos can be pretty long. 24 minutes is, is kind of an investment. It's part of why this week's assignment is just to watch the videos and get some badges. Because watching those videos and going through that process can actually take some time. So, Doing this is the first step to watch these videos. Then you can take a quiz. This quiz is, is pretty short for a lot of them. They're, they're less than 10 questions every time. And if you've watched the video and paid attention, it's almost always that you're, you're going to be good to go with the quiz. It's essential questions like, how do you turn it on? What do you need to use lubrication uh, if you're cutting metal, which is not going to be the case in here for this week? Do you need to, what sort of safety equipment do you need to have? Those sorts of things. And then once you pass the quiz, you get placed into a few, you get moved around in sort of the file system for Makehaven. But there's a few badge issuers. You can see down here, that are, these are the four people that will be handing out the badges pretty much all of this week. So if you want to, those are the four people that you'll be in touch with repeatedly throughout this week as we go. But if you're trying to get your badge, you watch the video, you take the quiz, Watch the video, take the badging quiz, and once you pass the quiz, it puts you in a pending badge status. So depending on how you click through the website, you may find a list of people with pending badges, and the list is actually pretty large. Uh, right when I showed up in June, JR commented on how lots of people were at home watching videos from Makehaven, so that when they next come in after you know pandemic times, they could get badged on a few things and then have new tools that they can access, new things that they can that they can do when they're here. So it's a neat way to, to level up your skill 
And then once you've watched that badging video and you've passed the quiz, the next step is to set up a time with a facilitator. So we're talking about Jen or Paul or there's that list of four people. You set up a time with one of them so that you can come in and they can watch you use the machine. You'll sort of have a conversation with them. You'll talk about what it takes to really turn the machine on. They'll want to watch you do those things so they can be sure that you'd be able to run it independently. And that's the, the process you'd go through. And they will move you from a pending status on your badge to an active status on your badge. And so lots of you have probably done that on a badge here or there. But then that is very often the marker that will let you turn on the badge. So there's how, – how long have you had that badging gated system for turning machines on? So two years. That's pretty neat. So once you have the badge, your ID, your ID card will – be wiped past a magic box that processes if your name has been added to the active badge list, then you can turn it on, and only then. So you won't be able to turn it on until after. When you're training, the facilitator will be the one to turn it on for you. So that's an important part of the process for moving through. If next week we're going to be building woodworking projects, this week we need to make sure that we get our badges so that we're all set to go. There's several of you that might have woodworking badges already, and if that's the case, you may want to look ahead to what future future units will be, so you can work on badges for other sections. I have definitely been getting badges for things that I don't intend to do right away, just so that I have them when the project pops up. So it's not a bad way to go if you're thinking ahead about the class and if you've got a little bit of spare time. But let's actually talk about woodworking instead of badges. So if we're talking about wood in general, this wood as a topic, wood is a thing to study as a material to work with could be a very, very long discussion. And, and while that's exciting, uh, maybe is a little bit off target for today. So we're just going to group wood into these three categories. You've got hardwoods, which are sort of the nice, classy, those are the ones that people like to make fine furniture out of, novelty items. Those hardwoods can be kind of hard to find and buy from time to time. But they're the, the walnuts, the exotic woods, the purple heart, all those fancy things that people like to use for decorative purposes. Then you've got your spruce pine fir. This is the stuff that gets built into houses that makes up your two by fours. Those, it's relatively soft wood, uh, but when you put it together with bolts and nails, it can make a nice structural piece. I've used wood like this to make uh, other things, to make templates, to make molds, because it's relatively cheap. You know, two by four is somewhere in the ballpark of $3, and it's a lot of wood for $3. So you can, you can do a lot with that sort of softer wood. And then plywood is an interesting one. It's a sort of technical material, but a lot of the time when people are brand new to wood, they're just like, oh, it's plywood. I can go buy a sheet, and it's no big deal. But when you walk into a big box store, they just assume that you know what you're buying, and you can really buy the wrong thing when you're buying plywood. There's lots of different technical pieces. We'll sort of go through those later. Uh, but there's the number of layers that you'd want to have in plywood. Do you want a veneer so that it looks nice on the top, or do you want to have sort of uniform layers. If you get walnut plywood, which is a thing you can buy from a specialty shop, uh, then it's got a, a walnut veneer, usually with a not walnut interior. And so those sorts of pieces can be really useful in the right context, but buying sheet goods like that can often be a little tricky. So we'll get into that a little bit more. They are nodding like you've got a, <laughs> a knowing story. Yeah. No, it, it totally is. Sheet goods like that are sort of a sneaky technical material that have specifications that you wouldn't expect. Like plywood is rated uh, with a letter grade for how nice the face looks. So if you're buying BC plywood, one side's going to look better than the other, and you should know which one the B side is. And, and then there's A grade plywood, double C or D grade plywood. Then there's sheathing, there's OSB, there's tons of it. And, and we can go through those things next week sort of as that comes up. But today we're going to focus on the tools a little bit more. Um, one thing I would like to say is that the specialty shops that I know about for hardwoods, if you're interested in hopping right into that field, the two that I've been to in, in the like, broad New Haven area is Rings End and the Wood Rack. Both of those are in Brantford because they're literally on my way home from Daniel Hand. And so Rings End has a, a somewhat good selection, and the Wood Rack is this crazy little shop run by a guy it's like one guy who's just passionate about it. He's got a forklift, and he'll, he'll bring you these boards and then tell you how much they cost. So it's like a, a fun, quirky space. 
Uh, the hours for the wood racks seem to be, they're posted on Google, so you can find them there, but they're a little, a little wonky. Um, I went on a Saturday morning, so they work, that's open on Saturday mornings, but it's not in Saturday afternoons, because again, it's just the one guy. Do you guys, uh, JR and Cedric, do you know of any other great places to buy hardwoods or, or wood? Corey, I did put into the chat um, a list of resources that's on Make Haven site, and it oh. includes um, that was compiled by members, and it includes places for hardwood, that including ring Fantastic. So those those are options that Kate has posted. What's up? Um, are there any good locations for specific plywood, like birch, iron fly? So no, you're 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 totally right, and. And I saw some of that at the wood rack when I was there a week ago. Um, Baltic birch is typically a different size than like the sheets of plywood you'd buy at Home Depot. It's often not at a Home Depot or a Lowe's. Uh, there's a few brands that are there. And, and really finding an exact type of wood that you want can often be a little tricky because it's, it's different. It's more like buying a vegetable than it is like buying a nut or a bolt where those are reliably put in the same place in a store and wood is cycled through based on what's available and what the prices are. And right now, all those things are a little bit more expensive because of COVID and shipping and all, all of that stuff. So th that's totally a thing that will need to be taken into account when you think about the scope of a project you want to take on right now. Uh, but you can do a lot of really nice projects with a small amount of wood, too. So we're going to go through what some of those examples are. Uh, I just need to be over here. I can unmute on my computer. Sorry, guys. I will I won't. talk louder into the mic. Sorry. So I was saying in a specialty shop, uh, you'll find a lot of plywood that actually are much higher quality for about, you know, 20% more in price. Can you hear? So for example, uh, one way to know if your plywood is not good is if you put a screw to it and it doesn't hold so well, uh, that's usually not good plywood versus if you have to just make a hole with a, with, with a drill and you have a hard time doing that, that's really good plywood. That's a very easy, quick way to know if you have a good quality or not. And for custom project, I definitely advise you to put 10 bucks more. Uh, mm -hmm. It goes a very long way. Okay. It does. And, and that softwood is, has got its purpose. It's great for underlayment if you're building a house, if you're doing different things. Those, there's different purposes for each of those. But Cedric's totally right. For personal projects, you want the nice quality stuff that you really have to drill through in order to make it into something good. For a, for a hardwood piece, you'd absolutely want that as a standard. So choosing wood can be sort of tricky. But for right now, just figuring out what the machines do is often the, the best first step before you're really getting choosy about your woods. So as we do that, we want to think about how to put them to how to put wood together, how to what tools are there, and then a big part is how to fasten it together. And so there's a lot of things that people sort of assume that they have some experience with, uh, and and your experience might be great. But just to be clear, there is wood glue is a great option for putting most projects together. Wood glue is very often stronger than the wood it's bonding, which really blows people's minds. If you were to take two pieces of wood, glue them together, and then break that joint apart, it will very often break in the wood, not in the glue. So wood glue is, uh, is surprisingly strong for lots of purposes. If you're putting together a cutting board and you're gluing together those pieces of wood, as long as they're straight and parallel faces and the glue is a very thin surface between, that glue bond is as, at least as strong as the wood, if not stronger. So there's lots of good reason to use glue in woodworking projects uh, because it holds things together nicely. Then you've also got screws and nails. Those can be for temporary or permanent connections. Uh, generally in house construction, you'll see lots and lots of nails because they are cheaper. And so nails are a great way to go. If you've got floorboards that creak in an old building, it's typically because the nails have loosened up a little bit and then you've got your subfloor squeaking against the joists and that's what you're hearing. I've actually had an older house like that and then gone through and before I laid a hardwood floor, sunk in 40 pounds of screws from the subfloor to the joists and all squeaking stops. So it is possible to solve some of those problems and just thinking about how your fasteners work can be a big part of that. There are also interesting ways to connect wood pieces together, uh, like some Japanese styles of joinery where the wood actually locks itself in place, which is fascinating. 
there's this Twitter account that I've linked to that just is a series of animations, and this is something straight from Fab Academy. These are all animations of different types of joinery that are held together exclusively by the wood. So these are different ways that you could connect things together, different gifts that were designed in some 3D design software, I don't know which one, maybe SolidWorks, uh, where the wood itself holds them together, or sometimes a few fasteners. And so you've got all of these different options for ways to connect wood. And these pieces of joinery can be really high-end woodworking skills that really make for beautiful pieces and can make for fantastic connections between the different materials. So these are, and like here's one with a little tab is going to be enough to sort of hold those together so they don't come apart. A joint like this was really common in, in older buildings with large beams that needed to be jointed end to end. Because joining ends to ends with glue isn't that strong, but if you've got these sorts of fascinating pieces of joinery, you can make connections that are really, really robust. Uh, this is the joinery on Twitter, it's joinery underscore JP. And so there's, this is a good one for the same reason. This is another one that's a classic in joining large beams for architectural beams for large buildings. Uh, and, and ultimately in a hobby project, it's probably going to be a showpiece to have joinery like this or to hit a stylistic look. There's lots of uh, Japanese woodworking is its entire own like subcategory that people absolutely love for the high quality joinery that's, that's in there. But I would strongly recommend you just sort of scroll through this Twitter account, see what all those things look like, because they're a really great way to make things stick. And then the last one that's here is cyanacrylate, which is super glue. Super glue is a, a great material for bonding things very quickly. It can make its hold happen in seconds. It's another one that, like wood glue, needs to be super thin. It won't uh, do a good job of connecting itself, the connecting to itself to sort of fill a gap, but it does do a great job of bonding things together. But wood glue is stronger in time. Cyanacrylate will glue very quickly. So sometimes you'll even see a road worker who will put wood glue together, and they'll leave little dots of cyanacrylate sort of where there isn't other glue, so that the cyanacrylate acts as a clamp while the wood glue dries. So those are interesting ways to get pieces of wood to stick together, although that would definitely be a more advanced technique. So let's go through order some starter projects and then imagine how we can use different materials to make that happen. So these, ultimately I would say these starter projects are going to be our recommended goals for you for the next two weeks, is to find one of these that you're passionate about and go after it. Get the tools that you need to do to make these things happen. Uh, there's lots of good resources to make this work. And so we can try and, and take a look at what they are. There's a floating wine bottle holder. There's a video of that on the page to sort of explain what that is, what that is. There's also one in the front entry window for Make Haven upstairs. If you're coming in off chapel, you can totally see that thing just sitting there holding the wine bottle. And it's taking a, a piece of wood, cutting it on an angle, and then drilling a hole with the hole saw. And that, that's why those are the minimum required badges for the week, right? Because if you make one of those, you need two cuts the chop saw, and the, the hole saw, and then you're done. So you can very quickly make one of those. It, it may be something that you, that you do, and it may be something that you also move beyond. You could totally get a few simple projects done in these couple of weeks. Uh, cutting boards are another great way to take a little bit, uh, to level up your skill. They require you to really square wood so that you've got those parallel faces so that they bond together nicely when you glue those things together. Picture frames are another good one. There's definitely some more tricky cuts in building a picture frame, but they can be a good way to test those skills because you've got to cut angles, you've got to cut the little recess for the picture frame, uh, and there's some of those pieces. It's one of the ones I'm going to be working on in the near future. Bowls cut on a lathe is another great one. If you want to use, some people absolutely love the lathe. I think it's a ton of fun. Uh, but it's a completely separate skill set from everything else woodworking. So, it, and it actually, a person who makes furniture, uh, each of these different like niches of woodworking had their own names. And so, if you're a furniture maker or a cabinet maker, or there's there's a term for a person who uses the lathe, I forget what it's called. Somebody want to Google it real fast? A, a turner, but there's like a a, a turner who makes like little odds and ends is its own whole thing, but a turner is like the broader term. There's a few like really crazy names because these names are very old uh, for what that is. And then 
Bird houses are a classic. Those are the ones Home Depot will, will, and Lowe's will run little training things for kids to build the bird houses. It's a fun way to go. You have to sort of imagine the geometry you want, fit the things together. It's a great three-dimensional pro project, a great way to figure that stuff out. Um, and then you could just do joinery samples. So if you're really already relatively good at woodworking, but you'd like to get better, somebody who is trying to level up their skill in woodworking may just spend some time joining two pieces of wood together with you know, finger joints or with a dovetail joint or those sorts of things so that you can just get better at the process of handling analog tools in a way that's controlled, measured, and makes a really nice end product. Uh, there's, there's lots of good examples like that. And then you've got your desk organizers in little boxes like that. Those are all great starter projects. Things that may seem a little knick-knacky, I, totally, I would totally say if you were to take this group as a whole. But they're awesome places to start for woodworking projects if you've got limited skill, or in the case of joinery samples, you can find some very exotic joinery that would, that would be a struggle for anybody, even if they've been working wood for years and years and years. So these are sort of the example things that I want to be thinking about as we go through the tools that we're about to talk about. So first off, how do you get wood to be square? Because when you get it from a, from a store, it, it will often not be square. Even if it looks square at the start, it's usually a lie. Uh, square is something that's very easy to measure. If you take a piece and you set it down on a table and you press on opposite corners, you'll find out if it's square. If you get a rattle, right? If it shakes, then you're going to have, then it's out of square, right? And so any two sides, you may need to flatten something out, remove the high spots, uh, so that you get all one surface. And so as you're doing that, you sort of go through this process in a wood shop to get you from the rough lumber that you've got, whether it's from a mill, or just because it sat at Home Depot for too long, and then it gets it square so you can actually use it for gluing and making things. So that process often starts at the joiner. The joiner is used to be big and green. Now it is big and black in, in the wood in the Make Haven wood shop. Uh, this one has moved on to a better place. The, the new one is much larger. It's much more exciting. And a joiner has a few key features. It's got a rolling a roller inside with a series of carbide teeth. Carbide is a material that will do all the cutting for you. It's a very hard material, which is great because it can cut right through the wood like butter. But when you have a hard material like that, there's also a bit of a risk because hard materials are also very brittle. So when you're using the joiner, you have to be 100% certain that what you're passing through is entirely and only wood. That there are, you don't want to use a reclaim board with a nail in it because you'll start breaking those carbide teeth and then we need to replace them. If the whole wheel gets out of balance, you can have a major problem that quickly spirals into lots of cash. What's up? What kind of board with glue in it? A board with glue in it should be fine as, as long as you're talking about a thin amount of a small a amount of glue. glue in it? So that shouldn't be a major problem as long as it's a small amount. Uh, and often you'll want to do that if you've glued a couple pieces together and then you want to get something flat. I, I have a question. Yeah, what's up, Aaron? Uh, and this this might be a, maybe a... a bit more advanced possibly but like okay let's say you have a really nice piece of reclaimed wood that you want to use uh, would you like to, to know if there's nails or screws in it could you use like a metal detector or something like is there some way that you can maybe quickly go through a reclaimed piece of wood to, to eliminate that possibility that is a fantastic question and the answer is a resounding yes we have okay. a metal detector in the shop and we solidly encourage you to use it if you aren't 100% certain that it's there. Yeah, it looks like he's running to grab it. Awesome. Uh, so that, that metal detector will totally work. You just run it over the surface, and if it dings at you, you know you've got a piece of wood or you need to dig out some metal. So absolutely, if you're using something that's been used before, 100% you want to go through it that way. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, and so to continue with the joiner, the way that it works is it's got the in-feed and out-feed table. There's, the in-feed is always on the right on our machines. The out-feed is always on the left, and I'm pretty sure that's always, always. Uh, but they're offset slightly. So what happens is you push the piece of wood in on the slightly lower side. The Oh, here we go. Here is the metal detector right here. This is what it looks like from the shop. If we hold down the button, you can see it blinks nicely at us. And then we bring a piece of metal. Here's a nail. And so... It 
there, there is a moisture sensor in there, and that's going to be really helpful for the table saw, because if the, the saw stop can't actually tell that the finger that it's hitting is touching the moisture, and so if the wood is moist, the saw stop could engage. So checking it for moisture is really important when you go to use the table saw. Because it grounds, right? Uh, it, it's checking for variations in, like, millivolts, and so if it's wet, it will... Uh -huh. the voltage. It acts kind of like a capacitor, more than a ground. Cool. Yeah, essentially, yes. Okay. So, uh, back to the joiner. The in-feed table is slightly lower than the out-feed table, so when you push the piece over, you remove a thin layer of wood, and then it gets just a little bit thinner as you're doing that, so you have to keep in mind you're thinning the wood as it goes through. And first you push it through on a face, and so you'll have a, you'll push down on it through the face and you push it across the joiner. It will remove until you get a flat surface so that when you press on opposite corners, it should not shake on, a, on an edge or on a table. And then what you'll do is you see the fence up along the back side. That should be 90 degrees to the table. And then you'll use the flat face that you just created and pushing it into that fence, you push it along the bottom so that you can, you can cut one of the edges so that, that also becomes flat and it is 90 degrees from the face that you had just flattened. So the joiner will get you one flat face and one flat edge that are hopefully perpendicular to each other. So that's the purpose of the joiner. After the joiner, we can move on to the bandsaw. So let's say you've flattened one side, uh, one face and one edge, and you'd like your piece to be a little bit thinner than it is. There's multiple steps where the wood will get thinner. But if you want a drastic reduction, a bandsaw can help you do a process called resawing, where you stand a board up on its edge and you push it through with the skinny side on contact with the surface. And so I should have grabbed a piece of wood, but here's the book. So resawing, you put the board up on its edge, uh, not on a face, on its edge like this. And then the blade will go down the center of that board or wherever you'd like to cut it so that it takes it and it slices it apart, sort of like when I open the pages here. And it actually leads to uh, an effect, a look that's called book ending or book matching, where you can take those cut pieces and they, they would have opposing uh, like mirror image grain patterns. So you're separating them out and then you get this really nice look if you glue them together on this middle surface in between where the two sides look uh, identical opposites of each other. So. Yeah, when you resaw, you've got that split that comes down the middle. It's a great way to reduce thickness if you want to reduce it drastically more than just like running it through the planer a time or two or any of those sorts of processes. So, yeah, we... One of the problems with resawing though is that your surface that was cut by the bandsaw usually comes out fairly rough. So after you're done with that, you'll want to take it and run it through a smoothing process, which is probably going to be the planer. So next up, let's talk about the planer. Thank you. For the planer, the planer is the next step. So let's say you have cut a piece with the, with the bandsaw and you've re on your wood. The next step would be to come to the planer. What a planer does is it makes two faces that are parallel. So if you have one flat face and then another face that was resawn, I can, I can also think about doing it. So you have one flat face on the bottom of your book, on the bottom of your piece of wood, and then the top is still a little rough. What the planer will do is the wood will pass through under another set of rollers. These have long skinny blades and it will remove wood from the top so that whatever the bottom shape is, the top will become parallel too. So it'll make a parallel face for you to match up. And that's a really important piece that it makes it parallel to the bottom. So if you have a flat bottom, it makes a flat top. If you have a banana for your bottom, you get a banana for your top. Not quite that drastically, but you know, in general, it's more about making them parallel than it is about making it straight on its own. The joiner is really the winner for that game. Uh, there's, oh yes. And so the question is, is there any depth variation on the planer? There is a whole host of settings, and if we're looking on the notes up here, this, this thing on the right here will let you set the depth gauge, and then you can take off different amounts. There is a certain, there's like a rating on the machine itself, so it tells you if the board is this wide, you can only take off this much depth. 
there's a certain power capacity of the machine. So if it's a very wide board, you can only take very shallow depth cuts. Uh, a skinnier piece, you can go deeper with each bite. So, so there's a little bit of that dynamic. There's also, when you're doing things on the planer, you'll want to think about uh, as you feed it in and as you feed it out, those rollers can sometimes bite into the wood. That's a problem called snipe. And so it's often if you've got 12 things that you'd like to run through the planer, you sort of, as one's finishing, you feed the next one in. And so you have this conveyor belt where at no point is the roller not in contact with wood. It avoids snipe and it can be really helpful. There's other sort of more advanced planer techniques where you can have a, uh, here, I'm just amazed by what you're up to. It's great. <laughs> the, the planer has lots of advanced skills. There's planer sleds and other things. If, if your joiner doesn't work, our joiner is nice and big. You shouldn't need some of those more advanced planer skills to get started. Uh, but a planer makes your, if the joiner gets one side, one face uh, flat, the planer is for the other. you and then we'll just click along the table saw is the last step often in squaring wood uh, and this is usually where you also will go when you want to cut shapes into your pieces of wood the table saw is great for using this fence that's off here to the right and passing the flat straight edge of the piece of wood along so that the other edge comes along your table saw is everybody able to hear yeah I realized <laughs> this was recording. We have a gap of audio in the recording. Okay, gotcha. We'll figure it out. Okay. So, in on the table saw, this fence here is especially nice. The one at Makehaven is a is a higher end fence than you'd buy than you'd get on a on a regular job site table saw. So it's a nice firm connection that it has to the table, where you can pass along your board and it will come up there. You should be able to. Oh, they're on their way. You're good. And so the table saw is a great way to make your second edge parallel with your first edge. But again, if you don't pass it through straight, if there's some wobble in how it passes, it's going to cut, the table saw is going to cut whatever passes by it. And that is, that is definitely true. A table saw is really a dangerous tool. It's probably of the tools that we have, it's one of the more dangerous ones because you have a spinning blade that's up on top of a surface. And even though it's a saw stop, it is possible to run it with the saw stop shut off. You probably won't do that by accident, but it's an important thing to keep in mind that that is a spinning blade, especially if you go somewhere else and they don't have a table saw that is a saw stop. So those, those are all important things to keep in mind as you're working on this. Table saws also have lots of ways that you can change the way that they operate. So there's different blades that have different purposes. There's blades where the teeth are totally flat. There are blades that are good for cutting sort of along the piece of wood. And if you're cutting along the piece of wood, that's called a rip cut. If you're cutting across the piece of wood, that's a cross cut. And so there are different blades for those different purposes. And they have slightly different shaped teeth. Uh, those teeth are often made of carbide instead of uh, regular steel. And they're welded on to the blade. Those things can be sharpened, uh, but hopefully that's not a thing you have to deal with this week. We want to get you through sort of the mechanics of how do you use these tools. So, how do you use the table saw for more complicated things? There's a whole collection of, and there's many in the, in the shop that we can go look at, but there are cross-cut sleds. Lior just made one with a big aluminum backstop. Uh, there are box joint jigs where you can cut little teeth into the side of a piece of wood so that two pieces have matching teeth that can be glued together. You can get an angle cutting sled that will help you cut angled pieces reliably into your wood. You can get a spline jig so that you can cut splines after you've made a, a picture frame. Oftentimes, the picture frame corners need reinforced, and so a spline jig can help you do that, where you cut a slot and put another piece of wood in to reinforce it. And then there's many, many, many other table saw sleds that you can look up, figure out how to use, and put to use for your specialty purposes. And I would say that the nicest pieces of woodworking that I've, that I've seen be made, they're often made 
uh, with the first step being making all the jigs that you need to make it. So the nicest cuts, the most bizarre cuts, modern furniture especially, has a lot of strange angles in it. And so if you're trying to build something like that, you'll very often need a jig to make repeatable, delicate angles that can add an airiness to a piece instead of sort of a blocky, just a, a sort of a collection of bricks kind of structure for something that you've made. So, uh, table saw extensions, that, that is a whole other thing that we could go for a long time about those. But right now, these projects, building a cutting board, you wouldn't need hardly any of those. So ultimately, we're, we're going to just say that this is a more advanced topic for later. Uh, another tool that can be really helpful, so this is just sort of a collection of what are the other tools in the shop. A sliding compound miter saw like this one is a classic for if you're doing trim work in a house. You can take that saw blade and you can tilt it off to this side or this side. And then you can also rotate this table so that it's pointed in different directions, letting you cut compound angles, which if you're putting up trim and decoration like you'd have around windows or crown molding, all of those sorts of shapes are very achievable with this sort of a setup. So having a compound miter saw and knowing how to use that is really helpful. But it's almost always for cross cuts. So the blades on it are, are like a table saw's cross cut blade where you can make cuts that go across the grain of the wood and, and it's really ripping it apart in that, in that way. Uh, the tricky part about compound miter saws is they are often the dustiest of the machines in a wood shop because when you break the fibers in that way, they give off lots and lots of dust. So you've got to be careful with that. A big part of all of this stuff is lots of sawdust, so be ready to get dirty is exciting. Uh, there's some other stationary tools that are really important. A scroll saw is a fantastic thing for hobby work for very small cuts. Scroll saws are fantastic. I would, when, when I was teaching at a school that had a few of these, these would be a great one to walk up to with a sixth grader, you know, a 12-year-old kid who's afraid in a shop, they've never seen anything. If you walk up to a scroll saw, and I don't recommend this really genuinely, but to adults who can think about it in a conscious way, you can walk up and touch the back of a scroll saw blade and you're going to be totally fine. The front obviously is dangerous, that's where the teeth are, but it's a very safe, a safe machine. This little red area in the middle is where you have to be worried about your fingers. Everywhere else is pretty much safe. This saw is oscillates up and down. It's not going to move wood very fast or far on you. This is a great place if you're looking to do little detailed cuts. Uh, these are often there was a, a, an amusement park near me growing up, Cedar Point. You could get your name cut on a scroll saw at Cedar Point as a kid. It was a great thing for your parents to pay way too much for to keep their, their eight-year-old entertained for a week or so. Yeah, it's a, it's a fun time, and getting your name cut on a scroll saw is a lot of fun. It turns it into a puzzle. It's a great way. It's a great gift for like a little tiny kid to have their name cut out out of big blocks of wood that they can move and put in place. Uh, so it's a lot of fun that way. A scroll saw can be a great tool for those sorts of detailed hobby cuts and pieces. So they're, they're lots of fun. Would totally recommend you get a chance, if you get a chance to use this machine just for a minute. The panel saw is a great addition to Make Haven. Uh, and then they have these in big box stores. When you're buying a sheet of plywood, I have never owned a car that I could put the sheet of plywood in. And so I would always buy it and then ask for it to be cut with a panel saw if, it could, if I could deal with that with the project I was working on. This is essentially a circular saw, a handheld circular saw that's put on track. So if you have an entire sheet of plywood, and we will have a week in this class where we make something big, and we'll each get a sheet of plywood, this is a great place to take that sheet and cut it into more manageable pieces. Because you can set up the panel saw so that you get long, straight cuts. Your, the rack that's back here will hold your sheet of plywood that's four foot by eight foot, and you can make the panel saw cut right across it. So if you want it to be split into two foot by eight foot sections, or you want it into four quarters, all of that can be done on a panel saw safely, quickly, uh, and, and these are relatively easy to operate. They, they will not let you touch them in the store, though, when you're at a big box store. They, they are very careful about don't touch them. I've been yelled at a few times. Uh, then there's the drill press. The drill press is a great tool. Uh, there's also a hand drill. A drill press is, is excellent because it's so very straight when you use it. There's this large wheel on the side that lets you bring the drill down. You can also clamp things to the table, and then you can raise and lower this table. You can move it around. You get a lot more control than you would with a hand drill. Hand drills are great for when you're on the move. This is far better for if you want to do detailed work and put holes in things in very specific ways. 
There's also often a depth stop. I don't know if there is one on our particular machine. Uh, there is, but the depth, I've seen many of them get broken, so I didn't know what the status of our depth stop was, because uh, people just sort of wrench on it until it goes. So be careful, but the depth stop is a great way to put a stop hole in something where you want to go down in, but you don't want to go all the way through. So there's lots of features like that in a drill press that can make it really be a finely controlled system instead of just random movement. I would strongly recommend you find a chance to try this machine as well, even if it's to put a big hole for a handle or a hole like in a birdhouse, the opening for the bird to get in. Find a chance to use this machine as well because there's a totally analogous one in the metal shop that we'll be using in a little while. So our, our like pre-planned project for the metal shop will probably have you using a drill press as well. Uh, then the wood lathe. The wood lathe is, uh, like, like I have said before, it's its own beast all into its own. It's there for turning wood. There's this driven piece on the left, and there's a motor underneath, and it just spins the wood. These are dead simple machines. There's nothing complex about them. There's a motor, a belt, and then a spinny part, and that's it. Uh, they spin the wood, and you have to use a series of chisels, which in Make Haven are mounted over here on the left. You want as much leverage as possible, so you should be holding those close to your hip, far, as far apart with your hands as you can get. And your goal is to just chip away little tiny bits of wood until it becomes round, and then from there you can cut whatever shape you'd like out of it. Whether it's a bowl, whether it's a, 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 a spindle, or whatever you'd like to make, the lathe is really great at building those shapes. A good trick with a lathe is people will make the sort of negative of a contour that they want to make, and then they lay that down on top of the piece, sort of edgewise. So if you have a piece that's spinning, you can check and see if it's got the shape you want by fitting it to that, that template that you've got. Uh, so there's, there's that. The lathe is really, it's becoming a turner is its own entire skill set, sort of separate from everything else. A router table is another, and, and look at that. Kate is throwing scroll saw pictures and lathe pictures on. Way to go. Um, so in... The router table is another fantastic tool. I would say that the table saw is probably the most uh, utility device of a wood shop, except for me. The, the table saw, the band saw, and the router table are all top contenders for the most versatile tools. A router table will let you take an end mill, and we're going to see end mills multiple times through, but an end mill is similar to a drill bit. Uh, a drill bit is pointy at the tips, so on a drill press you're going to use the drill bits. Those are pointy on the tip of the drill bit, and then the spindles are not pointed. They're generally just there to remove chips, whereas an end mill, those edges that are spiraled or sometimes they're straight, those are the sharpened pieces, and those do the cutting on the sides of an end mill. And so end mills on a router table can make cuts into your material. You can pass material over. You can go past an end mill and the router is able to let you cut contours. Uh, if you've ever looked at trim, maybe not in this space, but in a fancy building, you see trim or crown molding, those contours that are cut along the piece of wood are done on a router table, where there's a curve that's been cut, and you can sort of roll your board over the piece and get a nice, a nice beaded edge, some nice looks. All of that comes from router tables. Uh, there are also great ways to round over pieces. And there's many, many different types of end mills. If you're at Ring's End looking to buy wood, they have an entire selection of, of router bits that you can buy. These can often get very expensive, though, so you want to be careful if you're buying your own. There are a collection here that you can try and use and play with. They may need sharpened a, a touch, uh, but, they, but they are totally serviceable and a great place to start as a beginner before you commit to buying one. Just like, for example, one end mill, depending on what you want to buy, can be $50. Right, so you definitely would want to plan out if you're going to buy mill end mills for a router, what you want to do with them and have a general idea of where you're going. Because a $50 investment to me is, is not something that I just do on a whim uh, all the time. So those sorts of things you want to definitely take into account. Also, there's some very large end mills. The size of your end mill is going to control the speed that you run the router. So that's just a piece to take into account. If you get badged on this, there is a little flag that's there so that you can reference it and take a look at what it's doing. But generally, the larger the end mill, the slower you go. So that you've got, I don't know if I got it backwards. Nope, I'm no. doing something else. Oh, you're totally fine. So the larger the end mill, the slower it goes, and then the slower you have to move through. Speeds and feeds will be its own whole other category. 
that we'll go over uh, as we get through, as we take a look at, at all of this stuff. And I think that actually for the router table, the reason larger bits go slower is because they have more inertia. And so you can't overstress the router itself as you're doing that work. So you have to feed the material through it slower. You have to spin the bit slower. And the whole process slows down when you have a large router bit. And then hand tools, which is its own whole category. There's, there are tons and tons and tons of tools. There's totally analog tools. This is its entire category. It can take you decades to perfect these. So I don't want to give any impression that we're going to cover all of them right now. But you might have picked up and used a handsaw. A handsaw is a great thing to use. There's dovetail saws that have very fine teeth that can let you control very nicely. There's pull saws instead of push saws. Most saws cut on the push, but there are saws that cut on the pull. And so knowing which way the teeth are oriented is another important detail there. There are chisels are really great for removing small and controlled amounts of wood. They can be, they're often used in, in gross construction in the house for putting in the recess for a, a door hinge. But in here, they might be to take off that last little bit so that your dovetail fits together perfectly. Uh, and planes like that, excuse me, they need sharpened very finely. There's a Tormek knife sharpener or a Tormek sharpener. And if you get that badge, you sort of unlock this entire realm of hand tools in Make Haven. So I would totally recommend doing that. It's also a great way to, to sharpen your pocket knife. And it's a relatively easy one to get badged on. So I would totally recommend that if you haven't tried. And then there's planes also. So if you've seen woodworkers, they're very often stereotyped by the wood chips that they have and like those ribbons. When you press a block plane across a piece of wood, it should peel up a ribbon of wood. And those are just sometimes a very gratifying piece of woodworking in and of itself. So I would totally recommend that you get your uh, knife sharpening badge so that you can play around with a chisel, even if it's just start play around with a plane, even if it's just for the sake of making a few wood chips. Uh, because it's just such a gratifying process to see those things roll out of a piece of wood. I would 100% recommend. Um, and there's, there's tons here. Each of these is linked to the video in Make Haven. So if you want to just click through and get badged on these things, you totally can. Uh, these are all the pieces of equipment. Several of them are tied to badges. Then, here's the pneumatic tools. So these are nail guns typically where air is used to power them. And so these tools are for broad nailers, finished nailers. This is the thing that you're going to have to worry about when you're using the magic wand to look for nails. This is the most likely thing that you won't see in a piece of wood uh, because a finished nail is very, very small. It's something that you will not notice, a finished nail hole. A brad nail is a little bit larger, so you would see that. And then there's a pneumatic stapler and other pneumatic tools in general, and those use air pressure to make them go. Uh, there's lots of safeties on them so that you should not be able to stick them through things uh, that you shouldn't be sticking them through. And then there's an entire set of electric hand tools. So there's generally smaller versions of everything that we talked about. There's a small hand planer. There's an edge planer, which is kind of like a uh, piece. There's handheld sanders. There's a dovetail saw that is uh, electrically powered. There's a biscuit joiner, which is an interesting thing. If you've got pieces of wood you're trying to glue together, a biscuit can keep them from misaligning during glue up. They don't really add a ton of strength, but they keep them aligned as you're gluing them together. It cuts a little groove, and then you slide a biscuit, which is like a, a small wafer of wood that keeps the two pieces aligned so that they don't, when the two faces are glued together, it keeps them from sliding sort of like this way against each other, which is hard to show in a book. But like to keep them from smooshing as they're being glued up. That's what the biscuits are for. Uh, and then there's lots of other of these that are really interesting. A fascinating one is a wood steamer. So if you want to bend wood, you can totally do that. You need to steam it and heat it up so that you can bend it. Uh, bent wood is really a top level skill if you're trying to cut very thin strips and bend them and glue them together. That would be a, an amazing project for the next two weeks because uh, it's totally a next level skill if you're already good at woodworking is building a bent wood sort of project. Um, and I think that that has really taken us to the end of these slides and we're at 8 o'clock right now. So it may be time for a good healthy bathroom break as, as we go through. But there, there were almost no questions in all of that. Uh, there's tons of stuff being thrown up on the chat, which is great to see. Does anyone have any questions about any of that? Because we just sort of blew through all of the different tools in a wood shop. 
question. I just want to, I just want to uh, mention, and maybe I I missed it, but I didn't. I don't think I saw the Shipoko anywhere in there, and maybe because that's in CNC world, it's a little oh, yeah. different. But... No, you're totally right, Kate. The Shipoko I did remove from this section. I was going to throw it in with CNCs much later on, uh, but the Shipoko is a great way to do numerical control for your cutting. So it's an awesome way to to do woodworking. It's completely a higher level skill. The Shipoko though does make it pretty approachable. So if you're interested in CNC cutting your wood. It's a, you can hop on that thing in an afternoon and really learn how to use it. But I would recommend for this, for these two weeks, you focus on the more traditional woodworking pieces. We'll have a CNC week, a uh, CNC entire unit actually coming up in a few weeks down the line, several weeks down the line. But yeah, that's, that's also in the wood shop. Ada, what's up? Oh yes, so the question is a Japanese pole saw makes a lot of sense because you're pulling and so the steel is in tension, which is how steel is actually strongest. But what is the point of a push saw? And, and the short answer is they, they are traditional. And I'm not exactly sure why that became the convention. Uh, other than I think you can just get more of a weight behind it when you're pushing. There's like a limit to how far you can pull. So I'm imagining people sawing down a tree you can push a lot further. There's a lot longer motion I can go through to do a push. Uh, but my guess is it probably became a convention because of the, the way that they were made and arranged. Uh, I feel a little strange that I don't know, but it's, it's, it just is sort of the convention in how saws have been made in the Western world. So there's, there's that. Do you guys know any deeper about push saws versus pull saws? I think it's, I, as far as I know, it's literally just like the way that saws sort of made for. Um, I, I was told that it had to do with a relatively finer amount of control on the push for a more delicate saw and that if you were doing um, a lot of hand woodworking that eventually you would want to use the smaller dovetail saws or even gent saws because that push action was better for fine detail. Again, I was I was told this by an instructor. I do not know it to be true and I have not heard it anywhere else. So, yeah, apparently the push saws need to be thicker because they are pushing on the blade. Gotcha. Okay, so I'm going to repeat what Cedric just said. The push saws have to be thicker, so because you're pushing on the blade, which is steel is best in tension, so having a thicker blade, it, it means that you're going to have a larger cut, right? So I guess the takeaway there is that a push saw, because it's wider, you're going to have, even though you may have more control from the push, what makes sense to me on a material side is that you get the thinner blade for the pull, so if you're trying to cut very small details, the pull saw would be better for that. The push saw being a little thicker is probably easier to produce. The teeth are probably easier to cut into it. Makes sense from a manufacturing standpoint as to how you file and cut those teeth. It would be easier with a thicker piece of metal. So that's probably why they're the traditional piece. So anyways. We, if we want to ask questions from the group, we can mute the TV and they can unmute and talk to the group. Oh, gotcha. So that would just solve the... Sure. Okay. So they talk through the computers. All right. Um, but I think you got a question back there. We do. Okay. Question. Sorry. Can you get a dictionary for all these terms? Um, no, but there there are lots of those are linked through the the website. There's there's a bunch of them. So you have to say what it was. Oh yeah. Do we get a dictionary for all those terms? And unfortunately, no. But I was thinking, and and Kate recommended I should be making cheat sheets constantly about what are all these terms, what are the things that pop up in our conversations that we have those to reference, and I absolutely should be building that as we go. Um, but those those collections of words, things to Google, all of that would be really helpful, so I, I'm absolutely gonna start building those. So, we'll see. I wonder if there's a good word, woodworker dictionary I can find though and send it along. That seems valuable. Maybe there's one in the air. The, the one? one in the air. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Nope. This is Mark's handbook, the mechanical engineer's handbook. So, not quite. Close. All right. Um, any other questions, or should we actually try and take a bathroom break for a minute? Bathroom break? Okay. All right. So let's get back together in five minutes, and we'll talk about what happened last week with websites. So if you have a website URL, please send it to the, put, drop it in the chat if you can in Slack so that we can pull those up, take a look, see what they are. That'd be lots of fun to, to get those queued up and see what's going on. Otherwise, go to the bathroom, take a break, get up and move. All that's important. So, I have to tell you what happened. So apparently, this is recording only from this microphone. Gotcha. And uh, it is not, though, broadcasting to the hangout. Oh. So we've got two channels going on. And then I was confused, and I muted this, which means we have a muted recording for a portion <laughs> of the beginning. Gotcha. And we weren't recording on Google, so we didn't catch it. So we'll have to like dub in. Oh, I can just do the. Yeah, we have the video. So yeah. just you have to like dub a section. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, I don't think it'll be hard, but no. just that's the, we lost a little audio. But it, I was hoping their audio would come through this, but it's coming into the recording, but not into the Hangout. Fascinating. So I don't know how, I don't know, we need to like get some sort of mixer in the background to, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's what's going on. Um, and that's why I'm like back on the making you repeat. But what I can do is I can mute, because the, the problem, they, so if Cedric would unmute, like he's just, like he is remote, and as long as I mute this, there shouldn't be a feedback. And gotcha. then he can interact with the group. Cool. Um, yeah, because at one point I was trying to repeat. I didn't understand yeah. what you were talking about. I was trying to repeat what, what, what the question was. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but it wasn't going to anybody. So you're like you're like talking in a microphone, <laughs> and it's like it's just a placebo microphone at that yep. point. Yeah. Yeah, that's, it's tricky. Uh, if I understand it, like it's hard. And like, I was going to try and get in the settings to fix it, but I'm like, I'm not doing it while it's live. You know, yeah. like it's only gonna cause like Those when I tried to put the USB, right? what's that? Both USB, well, there. well, there's there's these ones that are on my head that are Bluetooth. Well, that's because the OBS. So you so do the software mix yeah. with the whole thing. Well, it's got it in OBS, but it's yeah. it's clunky well, at best. But you can so see. So I have a physical uh, sound mixer, oh, and we were going to set it up over there just for audio and other things. So I'm I'm kind of thinking about moving the whole station over there. Sure. Getting the audio mixer. And then inputting everything to the audio mixer, so I'm dealing with it in analog. It totally makes and sense. then it's like a stream coming in, and I can then be listening to the, the actual input because, like, I was listening to the computer input, and then I had to jump to the like. It's there's. It's I need to consolidate things into a single stream. So I is there any way to do this from on the computer itself? I mean, there is. It just it, there is a beauty in having. Yeah, oh no. A, no, no. A physical device. Yeah. Problem. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Yeah. Because it was. Yes. I'm going to go take a look. I'm going to show you that picture. Yeah. That sounds exciting. Yeah. So this, that was supposed to be mounted here. Yeah. The other thing that I should do is here's, here's this.
Sorry, are you around? It sounds like you are, but I can't see you. I can hear you. Good enough to see the bathroom, but um, I just wanted to check in with you real quick to see if you um, if you wanted to do anything with the form um, with 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 a feedback form. Like I put something together that we can share, or if you want to work on it more, we can do it later. No, I I think that it would be one of the one of the things. So like broadly speaking, to all of you as students in this in in this sort of a way, this is totally new. So we 100% want your feedback all the time. Tell me if I'm doing a great job, a bad job, what can we change, what's different, what, what is office hours working, is it not working, do you want me to keep pestering you on Slack weekly, do you want me to leave you alone, like sort of what are the, the things that you want to have happen to make this class work well. Uh, and like cheat sheet, dictionaries or cheat sheets or those sorts of things, like if there's those hints that come along that make sense and we can make happen, we'd love to make action on those. So all of those pieces, and the feedback form that Kate is talking about is totally to that end, to try and find out what's best from all of you. You can do it in an anonymous way if you'd like, so that, you don't, so that we don't have to know it's you, or you can tell us right to our face, whatever works for you. That's all fine. Uh, this is, there's, is Kate, did I miss the mark on that? I think you were, Kate really found a nice, elegant way to state it. I am in poetry training with Saturday and it. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I completely agree with that. Um, I was gonna, I'll put into the Slack chat the form that I have just so we have things in an organized kind of fashion, but I would also definitely um, suggest to everyone to provide feedback in all the ways that they can. Um, I was just suggesting that we we have basically a form that we ask everyone to complete a real quick checkbox kind of simple form at the end of each unit. So as we're building this for the future, we can. So I'll put that into the chat. And I, I was going to check in with you to see if we had actually made that, because I just emailed you this morning and said, that seems like a great idea. So I, I didn't know if it, one had been made. So cool. Um, up here in my hands, I know that maybe you can still see this stream and, and we're not really going. These are examples of, I think this is walnut, uh, based on the color. But these have been squared, so they're nice and square pieces. You want to come see a square piece of wood will be pretty sharp on the edges. These are the start of a finger joint a sort of big chunky finger joint, maybe more like a lap joint, where these pieces have lots of surface area, so if you're gluing together, they don't quite fit, uh, because one of them looks like it's cracked. But if you were gluing these together, you'd have lots of surface area bonded, so they'd have a nice, strong connection. Generally, you want to have en not end grain glued together, so this is along the grain right here. And you've got these grain connections, so that you get nice, even pieces of fit. And so there's lots to see there that's really Quality. And so you, you might feel that it feels heavier, more dense than the wood that you buy at Home Depot or Lowe's, but it's a totally different style. The, the wood there is sustainably grown. It's really, it's not nearly as dense, which is great because you want to load a truck up with it. Whereas this stuff, you're buying an entire truckload of walnut. You're going to have a really good time in a wood shop, but that's also tons and tons of cash. So. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Yeah. What's up, James? Well, first, um, so I got some of the badges taken care of this weekend. Cool. So I'm curious um, if I can get started and get help on the project. Yeah. Yeah. We can absolutely do that. We're just going to go through. Just repeat. Oh, yeah. So the question is, Jamie said that they have gotten some badges taken care of already, and so can they just go ahead and get started with the project? And absolutely, you can. The, I would 100% recommend if you've already got all the badges for the wood shop, this is a great time to just take the two weeks and build something awesome, right? If you're already a pro at wood shop skills, don't feel like you have to build a birdhouse. If you've got something else you wanna make, do it. Don't feel like you need to be constrained to the things that I listed. Those are just starters if you have no idea where to go. Um, I was hoping, I have a, I'm good friends with a guy who lives across the street that's a Tanzania Scrabble champion. And I was going to help him build a Scrabble board, but he, he was still choosing his wood before we got here. Thanks. And there's a quick lesson. To... <laughs> oh, that is weird. <laughs> Sorry, the sound is being crazy. So there's a quick lesson to learn with the wood that you just touched. Um, if you ever want to square something off, um, the idea is the humidity in the room is going to is going to change the wood over time. So if you buy a piece of wood in the intent of squaring it off, leave it in the room for a little while. 
because it's going to keep on settling for a little while. So you want to square it off after a few days. And if you do joints like these, you want to uh, join them really quickly. Otherwise, see, those probably fit perfectly at first, and now they don't fit anymore. So wood is live, so keep that in mind. It keeps on moving over time, whatever you do. Yeah, if you're building a full tabletop, you'll want to actually take your frame and aprons and not connect the tabletop to the piece directly. You'll want to get special pieces to join them so that they have the ability to move a little bit. Whether that's you put screws through oversized holes, or there's like special joiners that are made to, to connect the aprons of a table to the top. And so that just to go through the sort of ver verbiage of a table, the ones that are in the room here, the aprons are the steel pieces that run across the bottom of the tabletop. And so to connect to tape to the wood that's on top, you might need to have those special joiner pieces if these were solid wood. A good, a good detail though is that plywood is dimensionally stable because there's grain going in both directions. So it actually doesn't expand or contract almost at all. It, because it's got tension and compression in those crossing layers, it's pretty much the same size all the time. Seasonal. Like as you know, summer, winter, it stays the same. All right. Um, so I didn't do anything to pull up websites. JR, do you think you can get websites pulled up? And we'll do it on screencast? Or? Sure, yeah, we'll do it on screencast. We'll just throw it up on this big screen once a few of them are pulled up. So we're just going to go through and sort of see how it went. See if you have any questions about last week. See about the, the web and how it works. There's lots of things that can be confusing or frustrating about writing web pages. And it's totally something that you learn over five to ten years. It's not something you learn in two weeks. So if you're still you know, getting oriented with how to write a website, how to host it on GitHub, that's fine. Do not feel invalidated as a, as a maker because you haven't figured out all of web development in two weeks. It's part of this process. You will get more comfortable with it as we move through the class, but it's just getting in there and doing it is very often the biggest barrier that stops people from getting those skills that they need. So just by, just by jumping in, by having your feet in that water, you're already on the road to getting better at it. But there's, there's certainly growing things along the way. But I'm excited to see what people have made. Dun, 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 dun. You want to take over? Sure, I can. And that one, I think, is the feedback form that Kate made. So here's this feedback form that Kate made. I would totally recommend if you wanted to Go through here and submit this. There'll be one for each unit, so each person can do it for each person can do it for each unit. You'll be able to get a sense for. We'll be able to get a sense for sort of how this is going. What did you find the most helpful? What support or tools did you need or were lacking? And then how can we improve for the future? Because there's certainly going to be ways that we can improve. This is the first time going around. We would much rather learn it from you than have to try and guess. So if you've got feedback for us, we would totally appreciate it. Um, let's see. Next up, here is Jamie's website. And so Jamie, looks like you have stuck pretty much to the, the core of that template. You changed the colors around. Uh, do you have any, should I just click through? Do you have anything you want to say in particular about the website? Um. We can't hear Jamie. All right, so uh, come on up, try and talk into the it microphone. Won't, it's only oh, it's only taken for me. So okay. I'm gonna just repeat what you say and sort of expand. Or Cedric can come over and we can talk to your mic. Hey, hey, hey folks. Um, the echoes driving me nuts. I can't okay. do it. So, <laughs> thank you, then. I can't. Our, our audio system right now is being a little wonky. So. Jamie, it sounds like you focused mostly on Git this past week. Yeah. The website looks looks nice and classy with the all black theme. Uh, you've got a system that you can click through here. It looks like sort of as I go, there's tons of things you link out to other stuff. That's pretty cool. Uh, and you've got spaces for lots of these things. So here's your website build part one and part two. You've got photos This is ex and videos. This is exactly what we're hoping for this to build out into. And you've got this nice little title so that we can see what project we're looking at as we go through. So there's lots of this. It also looks like this is a template that would work well 
for writing in more, adding in more photos. Where did these come from? Did you just add them in uh, indirectly, or yes, are they? I, um, basically, just snapped the, the photo with my iPhone. I emailed it to myself, and then um, cool. I'm, I'm going to start using Flickr, but I, I just dumped it in the, the folder. No, it, it the totally. Totally works, and here you've got 640 by 680 pixels. So it's a nice small image. That should take a long time for you to overload the one gigabyte of storage if your images stay that size. Yeah. There's also Flickr is a great resource, and I totally recommend Flickr if you want to have a nice clean picture. It's very large, but there is totally some logic to putting your images straight into the web, also, because then they're stable and static, and they're there with your files, right? So if magically Flickr goes away one day. All of the, the website, all the pictures would be lost or unlinked. Whereas if they're loaded directly into your website, they're gonna be there as long as the website's there. Right, so th there is some logic to that, totally. But Flickr is a great way, I think, to make it easier on yourself. Uh, it's, and, it's, and it's nice that you can manage them so well. Right? Also, if you haven't played with this, you hit F12 in Google Chrome and you, and you have this lovely inspector where you can go through and sort of pick through a person's website and look at all the stuff. Those are, and here's the name of those things. There's lots of fun to be had with an inspector. Um, going back through Slack, let's just see what else we've got here. Man, there's so many good references and resources that are happening. If you could drop your, oh, here's Ada's. Very nice. It's, it's really just a logo. You know, a logo is really something that you can be proud of. I love that logo. And then you've got a template here that's really going to be built out into a nice, this looks like a, a sort of a blog format. And, and you were building, you said you were building this in Dreamweaver, right? Uh, no, I'm trying Editor X. Oh, cool. So, so Ada's using Editor X, which is a graphic software platform, basically. Yeah, yeah it's, it's like a, it's a pretty detailed, it's a, it's a, Does, so it's a graphically design. It's a graphic design software, probably with vector shapes. Does it output directly into code, or do you have to make some conversions? I think that it. I think that it will. Can. I haven't figured that out. Yet. Okay. Yeah, it can probably. Is but what it I'm. Also, like it is. Um, it's by Wix. Oh, cool. So it's. Like, it's so it's. We'll also do it all in the back. Yep. So. Gotcha. So just for the Good sake point. of repeating so people can hear. And let's try the microphone because I'll mute it on the computer. Okay, cool. So if people can try unmuting. Okay. Just let me know. All right. So we're going to mute on the computer. We'll try with this microphone. This one here? No. I know. Uh, her computer. Okay. So unmute on the Hangout. Un if you're on the Hangout, you could unmute oh, no. and you could talk directly to that if, you, if you'd like to. But Ada was I'm saying that... The platform that she's using is based out of Wix, and so Wix will probably dump code out so that Wix websites can use it. And so finding the vehicle to go from their code to your code is really helpful. Um, one of the things that I'd really like to see is by the end of the night, hopefully you can each send us a URL so that we can take a look at all of the websites that you've made, keep track of them, and it'll be really great when we get to like show and tell for each week that we'll be able to just sort of click through the websites and see what you've got posted so that we can rapid fire, sort of see what you made and see what the documentation looks like. That's gonna, the chat. you can throw it in the Hangout chat. Uh, the one that I'm, the foundation's in class. Like up here is Ruby's. And so Ruby has got hers thrown in here, starting off, very nice. And this is made, Ruby, the name of the platform is, is, is Cargo Collective. Cargo Collective, which does a lot of really cool stuff for you. You've been hosting your artwork in here for a long time. And so this is a great way for you to communicate out all of those pieces. You've got notes, you've got conclusions, there's totally a narrative that's building here. Uh, and as you're looking through, this is unit 1.2, and then it looks like you've got a unit template. This will probably just build out like a big blog, is sort of where it's gonna go. Is that? Yeah, I was trying to figure out how to integrate like, the package. Sorry, I was trying to figure out how to integrate like package managers. Do you want me to hold it? Oh, okay. Um, and but I was having some trouble with that, so I think I'm gonna take this next week to like 
focus on that too. Yeah. Um, but I, I still feel that like this could be improved, and I'm just trying to figure that out. Cool. Yeah, I think I think that it looks great. I want, but it also I totally get the constantly wanting to improve. I think that a website, especially one that's got almost no content in it, is like an empty empty canvas waiting to be filled. Right. So all of those pieces are totally. Uh, sort of how this is going to move forward. And this is a great, it looks like you've got a great starting point. Um, next up, Ogata. All right, are you in the meet? Can you unmute yourself and try and talk? I'm not in the meet, so I can, I'll just speak up. Uh, All right, the, hop over towards Cedric's computer. He'll, um, he's, he's running to you. I'm good. Okay. Uh, yeah, so... Um, I had probably a little more time to play around with the site, but uh, I stumbled uh, quite a few places. Uh, but yeah, so um, I've, I've input uh, video, uh, pictures, uh, you know, a little bit about myself. I didn't do anything with the final project tab yet, so if you click on that, you'll see nothing comes with it. But I've created, uh, yeah, just some pictures, uh, places I've been before seeing how that would work out. Uh, I played around with sizing a little bit as well. Uh, if you go into the unit one, two, that's where I played a little bit with that. That's fun. Yeah. So that, yeah, that was, that was, that was, uh, so there's a guy who was, <laughs> It was a fun, fun little video. Yeah. So, uh, and I had a, uh, a link to a YouTube video there too. Cool. So that's yeah. like that's learning the mechanisms, mechanisms of how to build out your website. Your website. Tons of, it looks like it looks you're, like you're, you're totally, you're totally building, building the skills that it takes to build a robust, robust like, 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 website. And that's how, and that's how it comes. Little, little, little piece by piece, sort of playing around with how do you size, where do you place an image. All of my first websites, everybody's first websites, they all look sort of like this, right? You get that transition into how do you make it happen? That's part of the growing experience, which is really exciting to get to share with everybody. Is it? Yeah. If it's easy enough to change the um, platform, <laughs> the, the layout later if we want to, um, or would it mess with everything? It, it, it depends on how you build out your CSS. Um, so the question is, is it easy to change your layout later on? And if you build your CSS in the most like supportable ways, then maybe, right? Uh, so if you have one central CSS file, like if we do on here, this is the CSS main styles. If you're in here, this is your one central place where most of your CSS is set up. You edit this, it should edit all across the website. And so that's why that's built into the template that way. So if you want to change your color scheme, if, if you decide you don't want to go with black, you want to go with all green, you can totally make that change and it should propagate site-wide. But like if I want to just maybe have just lines or if I want to just change the color. A little yeah. detail pieces to make those changes site-wide. Site -wide. Uh, you just want to do it in a central location like from this core page or from this core CSS file. Uh, it does not. Bootstrap is a platform that's got lots of shapes and and colors and and things pre-built in. And so, if you want to use Bootstrap to get some of those pre-configured shapes, you totally can. And you don't even need to pull it from uh, here. You can reference Bootstrap directly. It has a CVN, which is like a constant domain link. I, I don't know. Uh, content delivery network. It's a fixed. I knew Cedric would know. Uh, it's a fixed thing that you can always go to and they'll always have it there ready for you to pull. So if you want to use that style, you can pull it from their content delivery network and then be ready to use it on your website. Yeah, no problem. Let's keep going with more of these. See what else we've got. Uh, let's see, we did Vulgana. Here's Aaron. Aaron, you could unmute and talk about this. You're still on the call. Sure, yeah, I'm still here. Hold Can you on, hear me okay? One second. One second. We're, we need to unmute here. Okay. Wait, wait a minute. There it goes. Okay, all right. Try again, Aaron. 
Okay. Does yeah. that sound better? It's better. Excellent. So uh, this was sort of an interesting mixture of balancing both working on my website and playing around with Git a little bit more. Uh, so if you go to that specific unit, to unit one, um, I had quite quite a, an easy time sort of working through my template and updating this particular page to have some information in terms of the gallery and the video. That was pretty straightforward, but um, getting into the Git was a bit challenging for me, and I, I think I've got a good understanding of it now. The videos that I watched were really helpful, uh, and I'm looking forward to, to adding some content in regards to Git and what I've been doing with it. Uh, and then the other thing that's kind of exciting is that I, I discovered how to start inputting short code into my website to start adding animations and other custom elements that will bring perhaps a little bit more flavor or, or character to my website. So um, I'm, I'm in the process of figuring out how I might want to use that to, to make things a little bit more fun. Cool. Yeah, just, just little drop-ins of JavaScript can really add some liveliness to a website that's otherwise fairly static. It doesn't necessarily take a lot, just like cleverly using it. So that's, that's, an, mm -hmm. awesome, that's an awesome way to grow uh, any website because you totally had a handle on this to start with. It's a great way to push yourself to make it even even nicer. And also I think oh, I, I, I have a tendency to be a, a bit wordy, particularly when I write. So I think it would be awesome to sort of have some visual cues to sort of guide somebody through what it is that I have. That way, it, it's maybe not as like here's a bunch of stuff, read it. You know, I I wonder if if I could if I could work with that and um, and learn something new. So yeah, the the visual of the internet is really fascinating. Like in, in school, I remember being taught how to write to communicate, but never being taught how to show uh, or like build a UI for communication, which is a mm -hmm. really important part that gets neglected in teaching people how to communicate in a modern world. Um, so like settling into that and finding your own visual communication styles is really an important piece to pick up over your time working with websites. So it's totally a good goal. Um, and Git is scary. It's still scary. I'm, you know, Cedric is nodding. We both agree. When you merge some branches, it can be a terrifying event. So if you're all still feeling like Git is still a scary thing, don't worry. We're all in it with you. <laughs> it can be, it can be complicated. Um, all right. Next step, we've got Leila. Would you like to unmute and talk to us about your site? Hi, um, sure. Um, it's a work in progress and I actually have rebuilt it and I want to upload it again tonight, but I just wanted to give everyone an idea because this is a little more up to date on it. But I made it in Dreamweaver. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't know what to tell you. It's pretty self-explanatory. And then if you click on that first little icon, the doc come and save, that, that'll that take you to this week's thing. Like, I could already see a mistake, but um, yeah, I'm gonna do it over again and re-upload it. Honestly, it's, it's a beautiful page. Like, the visual style is nice and clear. Your color scheme is awesome. There's so much about this that's great. Even like that you have such a nice clean circular edit on the photo of you. There's, there's tons of great structure about this website. And I think that having done this in two weeks, there's, even though you're seeing things in it, the great thing about a platform like this is that for the, there's people in the room as I look around who are amazed by what this is. So it's awesome to get to, to see something like this come to life and, and be confident that you made this happen in two weeks. It's great. Oh, thank you. thank you. Yeah. Is that your logo? Is the question is, is that your logo? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's my, my name, name written in a circle. circle. Oh. Yeah. That I yeah, I get it. That's really cool. All right. Um, awesome. And then how does this, um, I think I was talking with you about Dreamweaver and Git, that those integrate. Did you say that? Yeah, so as soon as you go to 
start a new project or a new site in Dreamweaver, it asks if you would like to integrate it with Git, and it takes you through it pretty easily. Um, the past couple of weeks, I've been watching a lot of videos on lynda.com. If you have a New Haven library card, you can get in that for free. And after you finish each section, you get like a little certificate that you completed a course in CSS and HTML. And one of the courses was for Dreamweaver, integration of Git with Dreamweaver. So that's what I've been working on. That's, that's awesome. Boy, I, this, is, this is where being a local is totally paying off. I had no idea that this existed. And I would have totally recommended you all this direction. Uh, it's a great platform if you're trying to go much deeper with code. It looks like they've got Python, uh, Java, all sorts of things to take a look at. This is great. Yeah, I did the intro to CSS and intro to HTML. Cool. Yeah, that's, that's great. So I would totally recommend lynda.com. There's also Coursera. And Coursera is free if you have a library card? No, it, it usually. Oh, it's just free? Cool. So. I've always gotten like one step into these classes and then usually they ask me to pay. I haven't played with Coursera specifically, but that's about the point where I stop. I'd rather buy a book than pay for an online class. My own personal perspective, uh, but there's lots of different ways that people learn. And if you have the, if you have the ability to do these, they can be really great. So that was awesome. Uh, let's see, we've got Ben, let's see what we've got here. Oh, there's a, it's asking for a password. I put it in fabrication. Fabrication? Well, I, I, oh, so I should unmute, right? Yeah, if you can unmute, that'd be great. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, yep. Hold on one more second. Sorry, Ben. Okay, it's muted. Well, that password should be fabrication. Is that not working? For some reason, it's not. It's not you. It's totally me. Uh, that's okay. Uh, oh, it's square. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. Well, so I, I guess I. I I made one site on Squarespace um, that doesn't look like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, it's trying. It's all right. It's not a very interesting site. Copy and we're going to try. We're going to make this happen. We've, we've got too many things running on this computer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, well, so I, well, so I made this site using HTML and CSS, but then I had a hard time getting it to link with Git, mm -hmm. GitHub, and then host the website. So right now, I only have that kind of locally on my computer as opposed to online. But then as I was fooling around with other platforms, I set up this very simple thing on Squarespace uh, just to test that out and then ran into exactly the issue that I think when I was going back and watching a video, which is that you said, which is that there's like a very near in paywall on Squarespace, so it's very hard to do much uh, for free. So including the, the fact that the site is password protected. Well, I, th I think that there's, um, there's certainly some benefit to... Uh, can you mute? Can you see okay? I think that there is some serious benefit to playing around with all these platforms. Yeah. And I, I think that you know, if, you, if you're interested in paying for Squarespace, building a portfolio for class, it can be a smart choice to choose something that you can quickly crank out the pages. Because if code is unfamiliar and your goal is more to learn some of the other skills, it can, it can be a really effective method to choose something where the platform isn't in your way. You can focus on like woodworking this week, right? So, there's, there's lots of good to have there. I can totally help you, though, get that, that code up and on to Git and then into a page. So it depends on how you want to go. But, but yeah, 
Squarespace is an awesome platform. I love that it's drag and drop. It's very simple. I've really enjoyed playing with it when I've played with it, but it is, it is something that quickly asks you to pay. So there's you know costs and benefits to all of those things. But it looks, I mean, what, what you've got really looks actually very nice. It's nice and clear. There's your little placeholder for what you've got as a work in progress. And building placeholders is totally a good thing to do in building websites like this. And then here's your start for woodworking. Is this, do you do this uh, cutting, you made this cutting board? Oh, wait, wait, a long time ago, yeah. Yeah, that's still very nice, right? So this is a, a, a great place to get started with woodworking projects. You can see that these seams are just super thin, uh, and that's exactly what you want to have for a cutting board, which is awesome. You think you want to make another one for this week? <laughs> I want to try making one of the butterfly joint, I think. Oh, yeah. Like the butterfly inlays? Yeah. Yeah, those are really neat. That, and that's good for fine woodworking skills. You'll be using a chisel to make sure that the hole is just as big or slightly smaller than the piece that you're going to hammer in. So there's some really good techniques to get better at your woodworking skills with all of that. Uh, so that's awesome. Let's see. And then... Down here we've got, uh, here's, here's Kate on WordPress. So this is Kate building out her, the second time I spent over two hours for a push to work. That is very much an experience that we've all had. Kate was here, we figured out that GitHub this past week on October 1st, they switched over the default name for a branch on GitHub from master to main for plenty of good reasons but it is just tricky that it came the week that we were trying to learn Git at the same time. So uh, very good job from Kate and Jamie figuring that out with me on Thursday. And so, and that was largely Kate. It was, it was let me, let's be clear. Kate was the one that figured it out. We were just here as like a supporting cast. Just curious, was it multiple attempts at push or was it one push getting stuck in um, so if I can, I'll, I'll, I'll go in real quick here. Oh, yeah. um, the question was, was it one push that kept getting stuck or was it multiple pushes uh, repeatedly? It was all of those errors. We deleted repositories. We remade them. We deleted locals. We remade those. We tried it multiple times. And we kept getting hung up until we finally realized, until Kate finally realized that there were two branches because there was a part of the menu that we weren't seeing. Uh, and had we read closer, maybe I should have made sense of it. But Git is something that stays scary forever. <laughs> and so it's only through a team effort that sometimes you figure those pieces out. But luckily, we've made it. There is a video to sort of explain. Is there an audio thing I should be telling Oh, yeah, to? Kate was trying to talk. Oh, oh. I think she wants to present her. Oh, yeah, Kate, I'd love for you to present. Do we have sound for Kate now? Um, are, am I yeah, echoing or are we good? No, I can oh, hear you. Good. Excellent. Um, all right, I'm going to kick this up. Yeah, let's just go with the entire screen. Okay. Um, what I was going to say was basically um, that this week was a, um, an example of scope creep um, to the extreme, including um, the GitHub confusion. Um, so I think you can see you can see my um, my web page right now. We're working on it, Kate. Just give us a okay. second. Sure. We're, we're getting a windowed vision of what you guys are seeing. Because OBS is a lovely, infinite well. Uh, I'm trying to. There we go. Boom. Okay. Got it. You got yeah. it? All right. Now we can see it. So I think you're seeing right now, this is, um, this is the WordPress version that I was working on. Um, and this is basically just where I'm putting things in, putting in my notes um, and my blog posts. Um, some, some other, other things, things, I just, I just spent a lot of time experimenting, experimenting um, and, and hope, hope to kind of pull, kind of pull it all together um, with the GitHub, GitHub site um, in the future. So here's my little GitHub page. So I did play around with this um, a little bit. I have some sort of pending questions um, about links that aren't quite working um, and also about, um, you know, when I change these buttons over here, it would be really nice if they would change on all the pages instead of having to do that. Um, so there's some, some things there that I'm, I'm learning how to learn. Um, and then also I played around with um, just doing some stuff from scratch, which was um, 
was new for me, um, just doing the whole course was not pretty, but just, you know, following along with those CSS, HTML, Bootstrap in five minutes videos. It was exciting for me to learn to get things to be responsive using Bootstrap was kind of neat. Um, so it just sort of a, a mishmash of, um, you know, options, but I think I'm gonna continue to use WordPress for kind of my blogging documentation until I get the GitHub really solid, which will become sort of my final portfolio. Once I have a little bit of better luck with it, with the pushing. Yeah, that sounds that sounds great. There's there's tons of subtlety to get all of that to work, but it sounds like you're on the right quest. Building out your content so that it exists in one place can be a great way to, to grab it and pull it while you're building a portfolio of this sort of as we go through the course. Because there'll definitely be a week at some point where, where you've got this, and then you've got a little bit of extra time to play around with the website and make it exactly what you want. So. And then by then we'll have figured out Git and be total masters, uh, total bosses at it, absolute experts. That's the goal. Never, will, I, I will never be a mass, uh, like an expert at Git, but you know we can all get better. Um, let's see. And then back through, if I do this and then Alt Tab over, I think I am stuck in this world. So that might be, oh yeah, I am. Sorry, JR. Um, JR is mastering this OBS stuff. Yeah, we just, we have to, now. I get a word stuck in my head, it happens. You want the web browser, right? Yeah, that one, that one. That, that's great. Uh, we can go from so from here. I can just pull up Slack on there. I got it. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. Yep. Because we can just go to Slack. I think that there's maybe a couple more. And so, for you. It's a makehaven dot Slack. And so I set me up as a second me, and that's that's who's visiting now. So we've got foundations in class Slack. And so here's Linda and Kate's website, and that's the last website. So that that is that is it. This is the Linda at New Haven Free Public Library, and then the discounts for members, which is totally a thing I should click through, but I need to log in. And that I think is our full show and tell. I think that was everybody. So great job, everybody. Those websites are hard to make. Good job overall. We'll all get better at them as the class goes on. And now it's time for the total analog reset. It's woodworking. So let's let's try it. I'll be here on Thursday, same deal at about 4.30, 5 o'clock. Uh, be here till about 8. And I'll have some woodworking projects. I can help you with your woodworking projects. But the big thing is probably going to be setting up your badges, watching those videos, getting a time with a facilitator, and doing that this week. That's the real like takeaway goal. So. That, that's it, everybody. Have a great night. And if you've got any questions, we're going to leave the chat open. You're welcome to hang out, talk, whatever. So, cool. Then I think if we're recording, we can probably stop that. Although we, okay. might, we might not be. We are.